All right, everybody, we are back. <laughs> I, uh, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Filippo Moro, who is a Hello. professor at the Institute of Neuroinformatics at the University of Zurich and ETH. I have the pleasure of working with Filippo, and uh, he- Likewise. <laughs> I might be biased, but he's great. Um, so today he's going to talk about some exciting stuff on the temporal hierarchy, and we are looking forward to Filippo. Perfect. Thank you, Malika. I will share my screen. Uh, there we go. Can you uh, see my slideshow? Yes, all good. Perfect. Thanks a lot. So uh, it is also my pleasure to, to work with you, Malika, and it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, so thank you for, for hosting me to the whole organization of SNUFA. It's my first SNUFA, and so far it's been really great. Okay, so the title of my talk is The Role of Timescales Hierarchy key in spiking your networks. Um, and I've worked uh, along with Pao, Laura, and Melika on this on this presentation. OK, so if we're all here as NUFA, it's because we all find SNNs to be uh, interesting. And we know that SNNs can do pretty cool computation, and they have lots of temporal parameters. And the question is always, how do we uh, leverage all of these temporal dynamics to make, to make computation? And there's a few concepts that in the literature, uh, among which, for example, neuronal heterogeneity, so having um, different features in different neurons. Uh, and I've cited, for example, this one um, paper that is very, very uh, popular in our community. Um, another option is to um, brute force uh, bad propagation through time uh, and optimize all of our parameters. And again, there's another uh, reference for this approach. But um, I was wondering whether we could do uh, something more uh, or something different and take inspiration from, from neuroscience. And in particular, I was very inspired by the concept of uh, hierarchy in the brain. So the cortex um, is organized in a hierarchy of structures and areas. And in particular, I was inspired by this paper here, which is a review paper in which multiple people have gathered data uh, on the um, uh, on different cortical areas in the macaque brains, show, showing that the intrinsic time scales um, in different areas grows through the hierarchy uh, of the cortex. So can we use this for uh, spiking neural networks? Um, and so uh, what, I, what the concept that I wanted to propose is to um, utilize temporal hierarchy, which is a configuration of multi-layer spiking neural networks where the speed of temporal processing slows down through the hidden layers, going from fast to slow. And the idea was that the first few layers would act as temporal feature extractors, and the last layers um, would um, represent higher level uh, temporal information. All right, but then it, the question is, how do we uh, build temporal hierarchy in SNNs? Well, there's a, uh, there's different mechanism that we can use. The most obvious one is the one of uh, neural dynamics, and in particular, we can use even just simple um, leak integrated fire neurons, so first order differential equations, which are parameterized by this tau, this time constants, which we can play with. Or also we can play with delays uh, or causal convolutions if you're more a machine learning person. And you can obviously play with the stride and the dilation of the convolutional kernel. And uh, also you can use recurrence as the recurrent weight have an impact on the uh, speed of a population of recurrently connected neurons. OK, um, I have worked with two main settings on this idea. One is the inductive bias setting, where essentially you are, I was initializing those temporal parameters. In this uh, example, they are either time constants or delays from uh, different distributions in the hidden layers. So for example, H1 will be this, H2 will, will be this, and uh, H, by the way, stands for hidden layer. And then uh, it was all about trying to find whether this initialization was providing a performance uh, advantage or not. And in the second setting, um, the optimization setting, I am initializing all the parameters from the same distributions in all the hidden layers. And then I'm using that propagation to optimize those parameters. And then I'm asking the question, uh, did, I, did the optimization find um, temporal hierarchy or not? All right, and the two sets of tasks that I am uh, that I work with are 
the multi-tenant headache sore task as a toy task, and then keyword spotting. So the MTSX score you probably are not familiar with. It's a task that has been introduced in this paper earlier this year. And um, it's basically based on the XOR function, which you can see here. Uh, as, and I assume that we all know how uh, the XOR works. But in this case, the XOR has been extended in the, in the temporal dimension. So we have two groups of neurons, which essentially are meaning two input channels. And from the first input channel, we get a queue that can be, a, it's a binary queue, so it can be either high or low. And then we get a set of queues from the second channel uh, through time. And every time we receive a new queue from the second channel, we need to compute the XOR function based on the initial queue from channel one. So we need to compute the, to compute the XOR um, across time. And for keyword spotting, instead I used a very popular uh, spiking Heidelberg digit data set, which I assume we all uh, kind of know. Okay, so let's um, discuss the results. So these two plots, uh, let's focus on the one on the left. So the x-axis is the time constant different in the initialization of the time constants as I'm working in the inductive bias setting. So this parameter delta tau controls, sorry, controls the spread of the time constants in the different hidden layers. And I'm dealing with two types of uh, very simple networks with either two or three hidden uh, neurons, uh, sorry, hidden layers, and I'm solving the MTS XOR task. Now you can see that the performance correlates with this parameters delta tau, uh, meaning that the initialization and temporal hierarchy actually correlate with the performance. Um, going from two hidden layers to three hidden layers uh, degrades the uh, amount of correlation that there, that there is, but still there is some correlation uh, between the accuracy and delta tau. On the right side, we have some results on the uh, keyword spotting task, so SHT. And the colors means if, it, if the plot is green, that there is temporal hierarchy, positive temporal hierarchy. And if the plot is gray, it's the reference, so no temporal hierarchy in the initialization. And then uh, if it's dots, um, the network has 32 neurons in the hidden layers. Uh, otherwise, if it's triangles, it has 128. And the message that I wanted to pass from, to convey from this plot is that um, by enabling temporal hierarchy, a smaller network, the, the one with 32 hidden neurons, has the same level of accuracy as the bigger network without temporal hierarchy. And this, is, this has obvious implications in your morphic computing as you always are looking for um, you know, reducing the size of networks. Okay, so that was it for time constant as inductive biases. Uh, I also tested um, the same setting, so inductive biases with delays. And I'm not gonna uh, lose too much time on this, but essentially the same story applies here as well, where you can play with the dilation of these um, uh, delays or uh, causal convolutions across the layers of this uh, SNNs. And again, the performance uh, on the SHD task correlates with the um, um, dilation difference across the layers. Okay, and then uh, let's move on to the optimization setting. So. In this case, I'm also playing again with time constants. I'm initializing a network with homogeneous time constant throughout all the different um, hidden layers. And then I'm optimizing with the propagation through time. And these are the probability density functions of the time constants through the hidden layers. And uh, as you can see, going from the one, the second, uh, the third and fourth and fifth hidden layers, the mean of the time constant grows, meaning that the layers get gets low, uh, slower and slower. And another example of optimization goes with um, uh, recurrence, where uh, we can initialize a recurrent uh, spiking neural network with um, uh, all the recurrent weight matrices initialized with the same distribution, and then we train those recurrent uh, weights. And then we observe the uh, eigenvalues of those uh, recurrent, recurrent weight matrices. And in particular, we are interested in the highest value um, eigenvalue, which is the spectral density. And there is this notion that the spectral density, if it's high, it makes the population of neurons slow. And this is exactly what we observe because the first layer has a lower uh, spectral radius and then this grows through uh, the, the hidden layers. 
Okay, so but the, the question remains, why is temporal hierarchy advantageous? And to answer this question, I have to my side, uh, Paul. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, so continuing as Filippo said, like, why does this happen? So why is this a good thing? And uh, starting, as he said, like on the basic dynamics of a single neuron, you can think of this time constant as something that tells you how much, an in how much time does an input take to decay. And this by itself already changes the computations you can do. So for example, here on the middle, you have a very, a two very similar patterns, you have basically three spikes spread over time in purple, and two spikes very, very closely together in green. If you have a very fast uh, neuron, that means a very small time constant, it cannot integrate those three spikes. So it doesn't recognize that those three are the set of a pattern. So if you try to train this neuron in detecting this, it would have a very hard time. It can do a pretty good job for the two that are close to. But now you may say, well, then I'm just going to increase the time constant, make it able to integrate over long time scales. And you would indeed be able to do that. You would basically say, well, those three neurons, uh, those three input spikes belong to one pattern. You can detect it, you can train it, etc. The problem is that then it's very hard for this network to differentiate between those three spike patterns and two very close by spikes. So those this pattern with three spikes and this pattern with two spikes that are close in time. Basically, it doesn't select very well uh, things that require a very precise timing. And the way to formalize this, to think about it, is by the uncertainty principle if you're a physicist. If you're a signal processing person, it's a very well-known property of the Fourier transform that when you take the Fourier transform of a signal and you dilate that system in time, so basically you extend it, then these frequencies compress and vice versa. So basically, faster signals in terms of like higher frequencies mean shorter time scales and vice versa. Uh, again, in physics, this, this uh, ends up being a form of uncertainty principle, which means that you cannot really have a very broad frequency band and very long time scales in the single neuron. Uh, this is, for instance, in the middle, you see the time scale of a neuron versus a schematic of its power spectral density. And the slower the time scale, the more the frequencies are concentrated at the beginning. And then you can basically, you know, like take them, take the equations of a leak integrated and fire neuron and come up to the conclusion that if you need to detect frequencies that are within a relatively large range, uh, then your time scales need to be short. So basically, the higher the frequencies you need, the shorter the time scales you need to, to have in your neurons. But at the same time, the longer you need to integrate over time, the longer your time scale. And this, how long it needs to be or how much frequencies you need depends on the task. This is something that is just given you by what you're trying to do, uh, which means that sometimes it might be impossible to fulfill those two conditions in the same neuron. So. Minutes, Paul. What? You have two minutes. Ah, OK. So um, yeah, basically, uh, the way to solve this is to say, well, I can have a very broad frequency. So I can have high frequencies in my lower layers and then make them slower as I go up. If you are detecting a word, you need to first recognize the letters and then slowly build up the word itself. So basically, you can have a first layer that detects a letter by recognizing the frequency patterns on the sound waves and sends the letter to the next level. But because these patterns are a bit longer than the pattern than the frequency waves, you can integrate over time. And therefore, the upper layer does not need to have such a high frequency. Um, and basically, you can build that compositionality. Uh, you, can comp you can compose these patterns, uh, and you will eventually have very long integration time constant in the layer in later layers. Uh, and very like fast pattern detection, fast pattern detection in the lower layers. Yeah, now back to Filippo. Thank you, Paul. So, all right, so conclusion very fast. So the take homes are that temporal hierarchy seems to improve classification accuracy. And it's also pretty, seems to be a pretty general principle as it's been verified with time constant delays, recurrence, and uh, it's been supported by a theoretical analysis. But most of all, this is all pretty much useful for um, most neuromorphic chips. And in terms of the limitations, well, the performance advantage is not that huge. And also, we uh, have benchmarked on data that does not really feature uh, hierarchical data. 
as, for example, the uh, example of speech that Pal gave. Uh, so in fact, the future directions of the projects are to verify on more challenging data sets, uh, but also expand on more, potentially expand on more complex neural models. Um, perfect, so that was it. Let me thank you a few more people. So the whole uh, ICE lab, uh, which is Melika's lab, uh, all right, and this is the QR code if you're interested in the uh, archive submission of this paper. All right, Great. thank you. Thank you so much, Filippo. So thank I just you. jump right to it because uh, we're, we're just about three minutes late, not because of you, because of me. <laughs> okay, so the first question is by Dan, uh, that is voted uh, 11 times. Uh, as a control, do you see a bigger effective temporal hierarchy on tasks with more temporal structure? Uh, yeah, I, I would say so. Yeah, and also I think the theoretical analysis from from Powell kind of goes into this direction. Uh, the the task I've tested on, the, I would say, feature probably two levels of hierarchy, uh, both because this MTS XOR has uh, fast components in the um, in the spikes for each signal, so high or low signals, and then it has a slow component that you need to. Um, compute the XOR between two signals that are far away in time. But same applies for uh, keyboard spotting because um, uh, words are um, composed by uh, composed of uh, phonemes, but there aren't too many of them, right? So it's, again, not, not really super hierarchical in terms of data sets. Hopefully, it, it becomes better with more hierarchy in the data. But but you t you tested it on images that don't have a temporal structure at all, and it doesn't have any effect, right? So it's exactly yes. In the in the paper, there's also uh, a test on uh, sequential MNIST. So you feed uh, each each pixel or sorry, no, you actually uh, process the whole image as a whole in one pass, and and there temporal hierarchy does not have any effect. In fact, mm -hmm. but then if you were to um, input each single pixel, at, so make essentially make an image in a sequence. Then uh, again, you do get a um, performance advantage. Okay, cool. All right. Next question is by Friedemann. How do you choose the steepness of the hierarchy? Is there some principle, for example, a power law or similar that you can rely on? True. So the results that I've shown are based on a linear increase. But in fact, it's a very good question that I also ask myself. And that's why I made a set of experiments to play with the optimal shape of hierarchy. And I have parameterized this hierarchy with this um, function, with this tan h function, which has just few parameters, the steepness and the centering. Um, and in fact, uh, long story short, this is sort of the analysis of the steepness and the centering. And one cool thing is that, OK, so these numbers are essentially the performance um, difference compared to having no hierarchy, so like a flat a time constant. And all of this dots are, are green, which means that you always get a benefit in the performance uh, with any shape of the hierarchy. But there is a uh, this diagonal that has higher values and this particular point, uh, which has the mm -hmm. highest performance benefit. So yeah, hopefully this answers the yeah. question. Yeah. But uh, now, on a slightly analytical note, um, since you mentioned power law, you could, if you know that the data has some sort of zips law or that follows a particular distribution, then in principle you could derive what is the time the time scales that you should use but uh, obviously that if you already know that you probably know the data set well enough that you don't need very fancy methods um so yeah basically if the task happens to have a again zips law or something you could probably use the same uh, principle uh, outline in the in that outline to basically derive what the distribution should be cool yeah okay and I think I take one more question or two. Let's see. So the next question is still by Freedom. And by the way, everybody, you know, you can also vote for questions that are not from the organizers. So um, <laughs> the principle seems like it could be useful even for vanilla RNNs, LSTMs, and SSM. Did you try such initialization in those? No, but uh, but I know other people have. And in fact, this concept of uh, hierarchy. I have seen it already in some, um, I think it goes all the way back to, uh, you know, Schmidt Huber in the 90s, uh, obviously, like everything. <laughs> but yeah, so some people have used that in some, with some initialization tricks. Um, yeah, it seems to be uh, working also in different class of networks. Cool. Uh, thanks, Filippo. And maybe... Thank you.
one last question, which is from me, <laughs> uh, sure. is to basically say, you know, does, you see this effect of temporal hierarchy more in the shallower networks compared to deeper networks. And, and I was just wondering if you have an insight there, is it because, you know, the shallower networks have less capacity and so this kind of temporal addition, this temporal parameters and the hierarchy can enrich the network more than a deeper network with a higher number of parameters would or? Yeah, you essentially answered the question already. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I do believe it's that. I think if you have less uh, computational uh, richness in your network, with a shallower network, you probably uh, like the initialization is more impactful. As you grow bigger, uh, the tricks you play at initializations are less and less uh, effective. Cool. That that's my interpretation. Great, thank you so much, Filippo. We thank you for the opportunity. To the next session. Um, to see you guys. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> see you in the next one.